Soldiers of Christ arise, rise and fight your armor on. Strong in the strength which strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through His beloved Son. Good evening, and welcome to the Christian Report. Uh, the last, uh, I guess a few weeks ago, uh, Vincent gave us a lesson on, on what baptism is and how it's to be done and everything, just answering questions that had come into the show. And then following that up, we had Matt giving us a lesson on um, the, the thief on the cross and how that is not a good biblical objection to baptism being necessary for the forgiveness of our sins, for salvation, etc. And he really did a great job just putting that argument to rest. Um, so I'd refer you back to that if that is something that interests you. But just following up in the, the theme that we've been going through, I'm going to address some common objections to baptism. So well, let's just lay out what baptism is really quick, and then we'll deal with some of those objections. So number one, baptism in water is for the remission of your sins, for my sins. This is what the Bible says, Acts 2.38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So you see, Peter is very clear. If you want the remission of sins, you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. If you have not done that, then you you don't have the forgiveness of your sins. You don't have the remission of your sins. You're still in your sins. Now, if you don't like that, if you don't agree with that, we'll have to take it up with the Bible. I have my personal cell phone number here that I would love to talk to you about this. This has eternal consequences. But let's continue. Acts 22, 16. And now, why tarriest thou? Ananias said to Saul, who would become Paul, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. It's clear. If you want the remission of sins, you need to be baptized in water. Okay. It's also for the reason of putting on Christ. Galatians 3.27 For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Can you be saved if you don't have Christ? What about Colossians 2? Colossians 2, starting in verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. This goes back to the remission of sins part. But look at verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Can you be saved if you're not raised with Christ? Verse 13, And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And finally, last point we'll look at just real quick. Being baptized in water is not only for the remission of, sin, of your sins, it's not only for putting on Christ, or for necessity for being raised with him. But ultimately, the Bible comes out clearly and says, Baptism now saves you. 1 Peter 3.21 The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not just taking a bath or getting wet. But it's the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why, is it a good, why does it give us an answer of a good conscience towards God? Well, how can you have a good conscience towards God if you don't have the remission of your sins? You see, you may have what you believe is a good conscience towards God if you've maybe said the sinner's prayer like you've been told or something of that sort. But that is a seared conscience, not one that has correctly appealed to God for a clear conscience. And Jesus himself said in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Do you believe Jesus or are you going to take the word of your pastor or priest or whoever 
and allow you to not obey the clear commands that were given to you. So let's look at some common objections to baptism. The first one is, is this, in Acts 2.38 that we just read, that where it says, for the remission of your sins, the argument is that that should be translated because of the remission of your sins. It just happened by chance. I had a, a video pop up in my suggestion feed on YouTube today from a few Baptists. I listened to it and this argument actually came up in, that, in their argument against baptism. But Acts 2.38, let me read this and I'm going to plug in their supposed interpretation, translation of that for being because of. So Acts 2.38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for or because of the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, there's a few problems with that. Well, at least a few. We're just going to look at three today. First one, translation. That Greek word that is translated for here is the Greek word ice, E-I-S, ice. If you look in your concordance, bring out your Strong's or Blue Letter Bible or whatever, you can search and find that that Greek um, word, ice, is found 1,774 times in your New Testament. This word, if you look in your, in your King James Version, your New King James, nearly any translation out there, I think the ESV may trans have messed it up a little bit, but this Greek word ice, of those 1,774 times, not once is it translated because of. Yet, for some reason, we're supposed to believe this is the exception to the rule. This is a classic case of reading your doctrine into the text rather than letting the text inform your doctrine. Point number two, and this relates to the translation issue, but what about consistency? Okay, this here, this is the, the Greek phrase that you have up here for the remission of sins. It's the same exact same Greek um, phrase as you have here in Matthew 26, 28. So let's read that. Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, Jesus says, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, if this Greek phrase should, if it, if it, it should, if it means because of the remission of sins, like we're supposed to believe in Acts 2.38, then for consistency's sake, why wouldn't the same exact Greek phrase mean because of in this phrase? So let me plug that in down here. For this is my blood of the New Testament, Jesus says, which is shed for many because of the remission of sins. Are you going to sign off on that? Jesus did not have to die because you already had your forgiveness of sins. It just doesn't work. Point number three, just the text itself. The argument is trying to get around baptism being, nece being necessary. But notice in Acts 2.38, it's repentance and ba being baptized, baptism that are required. So let's plug that in. Just putting baptism off on the back corner, let's, let's look at repentance and see how it works in this train of thought. Repent because of the remission of sins. You need to say sorry and have a change of mind for something that's already changed, that you've already been forgiven for. But it gets worse. Repent because of, you already have, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Do you understand the issue there? Repent because of, you're looking forward, or you already have something, something that you don't have yet. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you have someone telling you that Acts 2.38 does not teach the necessity of baptism because it means because of, they are lying to you. They are misinforming you. Common objections to baptism. 1 Corinthians 1.17 The Apostle Paul says, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. 
So the argument goes, see, he's not, he wasn't sent to baptize. It's not important. It's not part of the gospel. Okay, well, let's back up for a second. Let's look at the context. Okay, what are we talking about here? 1 Corinthians 1, starting in verse 12. And now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. He asks, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were, you, were ye baptized in the name of Paul? Verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus, because besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Okay, so what's the context leading up to verse 17? This here is that there's division going on. People are being sectarians. They're, they're claiming a name rather than Christ. Paul said that this was wrong. He did not want them to be doing this. It was still important though, because notice if they were being baptized by an individual and they're calling themselves after the name of the individual that baptized them, they realized that that, that, that baptism had an importance. Uh, it was important. Further, Look at this. If, if Paul was not sent to baptize, why did he still baptize people? Verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you. Why? Because he didn't want them calling them after his name. They wanted him following Christ. But he did baptize Crispus and Gaius. And verse 16, and also the household of Stephanus. And he doesn't remember if there were any others, verse 16. So they were still baptized. The people that were being baptized understood the importance of baptism. And so they were putting the wrong emphasis on who did it rather than on who they were baptized into in Jesus Christ. But finally, notice this. This here is an example of the not but construction that you find all over your Bible. 1 Corinthians 1.17, this is the verse that the argument comes from. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Okay, notice John 6.27. This is the same not but construction. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat, for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Or what about 1 Timothy 2.9? In like manner also the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Okay, so what, what is the not but construction? Well, let me read it into these verses to illustrate. For Christ sent me not only to baptize, or of more importance, of less importance to baptize, but more importantly, to preach the gospel. John 6, 27. Labor not only for the meat which perisheth, but more importantly for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. 1 Timothy 2, 9. Not with broided hair, or not only with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but more importantly, with modest apparel, professing godliness with good works. You see, if you're not, if you're going to apply this, uh, this, this not but construction consistently throughout the scriptures, and you're going to say that 1 Corinthians 1.17 means that baptism was not to be done, that, Paul, that it's not part of the gospel, then John 6.27 tells you not to work for the meat which perisheth. You better stop working to provide for you and your family. 1 Timothy 2.9, women, you better not be braiding your hair or hopefully, hopefully you don't have gold in your, in your ring. It is showing a, an emphasis of importance. It's not only to baptize, but more importantly to preach the gospel. 
Common objections to baptism. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And, and to that I say amen. But the argument that I hear is, see, Ephesians 2.8 By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. See, it's faith alone. It's faith only. Well, I... First, I don't see faith only or faith alone in this passage. In fact, if you do a, a search in your Bible, the only time faith alone or faith only is found is James 2, 24. And this is what James says. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So if this is the only place where you can find faith alone or faith only, it's preceded by not by faith only. Further, for if it's going to be faith alone that's required, even in this even in this one verse in Ephesians 2:8, we've got not only faith being required, but also grace. So if you have Faith alone, that excludes grace. But we obviously know that grace is required. It's through faith that we are saved, not faith alone. And you notice that there's no repentance or confession included here in Ephesians 2.8 or the idea of faith alone. Repentance is absolutely required. Jesus said so. Luke 13, 3 and 5. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Two verses later, he repeats himself. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. What about confession? Romans 10, 9 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Okay, so we believe in our heart and we need to confess with our mouth. It's not faith alone. Are we saved by faith? Absolutely. But we are saved by a biblical faith. Hebrews 11.6, this is the definition of faith. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews chapter 11. I, after this study, I, I pray that you'll just pick up your Bible and read Hebrews, chap, read Hebrews chapter 11. This will give you a, an understanding of what biblical faith is. You see, if you, if you read through that, you're going to have by faith and then a name. You're going to have Abel, you're going to have um, Noah, you're going to have Enoch, you're going to have Abraham, and many others. By faith, that individual did something. They, they, they obeyed, they, they moved, they, they followed God's instructions and commands. They believed God, they had faith, and so they acted consistently with that. They obeyed His instructions. We have examples of faith or belief alone in the scriptures, and it's not favorable. Here's just one, John 12, 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. They believed in him. They saw his works. They, knew, they, they believed who he said he was. But, verse 42 continues, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Their faith did them no good because they did not have a biblical faith. They did not act on what they believed to be true. Okay, common objections to baptism. This is one that I'm hearing more and more recently. The argument goes like this. Yes, baptism is, is essential for salvation but it's not water baptism. It's, it's spirit baptism, it's Holy Spirit baptism, it's Holy Ghost baptism, not the water. Well, first off, I'd say, please prove it, because that is a new interpretation that has just recently come, around, come about. If you go back 
just to the, the Reformation, read John Calvin or Martin Luther, any of those ones, they all see these passages as water baptism. They explain them away for different reasons, but they don't say that they're spirit baptism. So if you're going to come with a new interpretation that I haven't been able to find anywhere in church history going back, you, you better have a pretty good reason for why your interpretation 2,000 some years later is, is what's actually true, what God had in mind. Point number two, let's just lay that aside. Let, let's take for granted that your argument is correct. Let's say it is Holy Ghost baptism that saves you, that saves anyone. Do you know anyone that's saved? Are you saved? You see, the Bible tells us what Holy Spirit baptism is. So let's see what the definition that the scriptures give. We have two examples of Holy Spirit baptism in the New Testament, in the Bible. Acts 2 and Acts 10. Let's read Acts 2 first. Acts 2, 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house. Did that happen when you believed you were saved? And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Did that happen to you when you thought you were saved? And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, now, our, our Pentecostal charismatic, char charismatic friends, you may claim that, that you have this, that you have done this. But after you finish reading Hebrews chapter 11, I want you to go to Acts chapter 2 and just continue reading from verse 5 and down. These unlearned men go out and start preaching the first gospel sermon. You have people from all over the known world that had come to Jerusalem for Pentecost. And each one of them heard the gospel message in their own native tongue. Have you done that? If I were to pick you up and drop you in the middle of Africa or in the middle of Asia, would you be able to speak in tongues so that the, the native people there could hear you and understand you in their native tongue. If not, you haven't had Holy Ghost baptism. Acts 10.44, the second example. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, and as many as had come with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Okay, so you see, the, the, he, Peter comes and says, These people, why can't they receive baptism? Let, let's give it to them. Let's not forbid them water, because they have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. Okay. What does that mean? That they received it as they did? Well, thankfully we have divine commentary in the next chapter, Acts chapter 11. And the apostles and brethren which that were in Judea heard the Gentiles had received the word of God. This is Cornelius and his household that we just read about. But some of the circumcision contended with him. Verse 2. So, Peter is defending and explaining what happened, and picking up in verse 15, he said this, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. At the beginning being Acts chapter 2 that we read first. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he had said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Peter is saying that what they got in Acts 2 is what happened in Acts chapter 10. For as much then as God gave them the gift, like he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? And so he baptized them. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So you see, if you have not 
had this miraculous gift where you can speak in tongues where other people can hear you in their native language that you have not studied. You haven't been baptized in the Holy Ghost. You haven't been saved. Is that what you are going to hold to? What about the one baptism in Ephesians 4, verse 5? Ephesians 4, starting in verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Okay, now, if there's only one baptism, and the argument is that you're saved by Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost baptism, and that water baptism just is something that you do for outward sign, inward grace, or those that argue that water baptism isn't for us at all today, if that's the case, then the one baptism here must be Holy Ghost baptism, which I would argue with. But let's just say for the sake of argument, this one baptism is Holy Ghost argument, it is, is the Holy Ghost baptism. If that's the case, and, I, and that video that I listened to earlier today, they, they reference baptism as being an outward sign of an inward grace. Okay, that's, that's number one here. If it's an outward sign of an inward grace, You've already been baptized in the Holy Ghost, and now you go and get baptized in water as an outward sign of inward grace. Why not just set up an idol? There's only one baptism according to the Apostle Paul. The very next two words is there's only one God. So if you can have one baptism in water that represents what's already happened in Holy Spirit baptism, then why not just set up an idol that represents the God that's actually the one there? Maybe the Catholics are onto something. Second argument, that water baptism isn't for us today. These are our dispensationalist friends. If that's the case, you can throw out 70% of your New Testament because Paul only wrote about 28% of it. But besides that, even if that's the case, Paul still baptized people in water. So if Paul did that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, then again, if the one baptism is only, or if that one baptism is Holy Ghost baptism, you still go ahead and set up an idol to represent the one God. This is not a good objection running out of time the argument of it doesn't say baptism in this text therefore it's not required okay John 3 16 Romans 10 9 these are common verses um, that this argument is used with so let's just John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life see it doesn't say baptism it's not required Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Okay, see, just confess with your mouth and believe. That's all, it doesn't say baptism. Well, those two verses contradict themselves if that's what you're arguing because John three sixteen says only to believe, but Romans 10, 9 says you must confess with your mouth and believe. So this doesn't seem to be a good argument. If I, if I was asked by someone, uh, are you married? And I've said, yes, yes, I'm a husband. And someone else asked me, do you, do you have any kids? Yes, I'm a father. And someone says, is that your dad? I said, yes, I'm a son. Did I lie to any of those individuals? No, of course not. You have to take the whole of who I am and what I've said. Just because I only told one person, if I, if just because I told one person that I'm I'm a husband, and I didn't say I'm also a father, I'm also a son, doesn't make the phrase that I'm a husband untrue, but it also doesn't get rid of all the other roles that I have. The same way we must take the whole of Scripture. Just take, take a screenshot of this and study these passages. All these things are referenced as being requirements. I'm going to go ahead and give you our contact information. Here it is here. Um, I appreciate um, your time this evening and the opportunity to study together. 
Pray that you have a great evening.